Oscar directed at Canvas saw it. Catherine, what did you think of the production? I loved it. <laughs> I loved it, especially Brutus. He was <laughs> uh, no, it was it was just fantastic. And I have to say, I wrote a column about it um, where I talked about the whole, you know, Trump as Julius Caesar thing and I'm very interested in Roman history, so I was um, struck by how inferior Trump is to Julius Caesar. <laughs> um, he, should have been, although he should have been flattered. Um, but I thought that was a very smart point that she made. Like. I, I, I loved, I loved Ju um, um, Mark Antony as a woman, as a southern senatorial sounding woman in, um, in sweatpants. Um, I thought that um, the scene where Trump, where Julius Caesar is in the bathtub with his wife. <laughs> it was so funny. So some of you all have seen it? Can I get yeah, a show of hands? Yeah. Have seen it? Oh, great. Oh, wow. Okay. That's fabulous. Okay. Yeah, and I thought, if I, I don't want to talk too much about it, but um, I did think a wonderful thing about it was, unlike real life Trump, who I never feel a human moment from or anything positive about him, Julius Caesar actually is kind of wonderful in the play. He's wonderful as Trump. Um, he's jovial, he's big and larger than life, and he's kind of fun. And you can see why people <laughs> really like him. Um, so I thought it was just a brilliant production. Just brilliant. I'm so glad that I got to see it. So I wanted to ask you that because I also wonder, you know, is this a good play? Does that matter in this conversation? Is it good? Is Julius Caesar a good play? The play, the production that you put on. No, but the play is really, really good. <laughs> we did our best with the production. But, you know, what I will say is, you know, somebody who produces and directs Shakespeare for most of my career as a living, um, Shakespeare is astonishing that way because he, he is such a brilliant writer that somehow the plays ceaselessly have this ability to take on different colors and different shapes depending on the moment they perform. And that's what our job is. We the produce theater because theater's a funny art form. Shakespeare wrote his plays, but he didn't even care if they were published. He paid no attention to publishing them. The event was the performance. So what we're always doing is we, the work of art only happens in a specific time in a specific place. That's when it becomes itself. And our job is to make it feel like our time and place audience. Right, which is another interesting point that Catherine made in her piece, which is that you know um, Shakespeare was a brilliant writer and all, went through this list of things that, that Caesar was and that Trump is not. And you had said in the, in the New York Times, because of course it's not Trump. What do you think, Corey, the, the people who, um, you know, this you quote unquote right wing hecklers, what, what was the visceral response to them? I think, well, first of all, I don't think anybody who responded actually, there was not a single person who, who protested, who sat through the entire play, uh, and, which is pretty important. Uh, context is, is important. And I think uh, this was a case where it looked like it was a chance for, for points to be scored uh, in a game, in a political game. And I think we got caught in the middle of it. There was a lot to, engage with in the production. There was a lot that uh, you know somebody of, of good faith could, uh, could could argue with, but that wasn't the conversation that they brought to us. It was simply about, we found this, there's this one moment, uh, there's one image that we've broadcast to the world of the, of the assassination, and we're going to uh, you know, claim that to, uh, to show something is to endorse it. And so, it was and so what were the points? What points well, were, were gained? Well, the, the, the thing that I was unprepared for and that I was naive, I assumed, of course, you don't do a production like this without assuming there's going to be some controversy. It would be childish on this. I knew there'd be some controversy. I thought the controversy would be about the production. It wasn't. And I can really agree with Corey. None of it was about the production. It was about a narrative that was put out on the right-wing media about the production. Nobody who saw the production, it, it's not just that none protested, nobody who saw the production all the way through actually had that response to it. So then how is it not about the production? It's about the narrative that's being talked about about the production on social media and digital. Okay. 
Okay. And so that Say means, more about that. But what that means is that it was seized upon uh, directors interpreting Shakespeare in a politically controversial way has happened since Essex had Shakespeare put on Richard II in order to try and stir up energy for his coup against Elizabeth. While Shakespeare was still alive, people have people done that for 400 years. What's new is we have a media machine that isn't interested in what my show was, wasn't interested in seeing my show, wasn't interested in talking about my show, was seizing upon it as a way to stir up this right-wing base, which serves their interest to have that base stirred up. We were just the stirring up thing du jour. Okay, I mean, I need, I, I need for us to walk this back a little bit because this whole idea of a right-wing narrative, yep. which we're now just talking about, even though that has been the narrative since the dawn of this country. Um, but who, like, what was it that you read, or what media are you talking about that that capitalized on that? Well, the two, the two things that I think were turning points, um, the whole thing started about two and a half weeks into production when a woman from the South, uh, or she was, she was the tourism secretary for a state, I'm sorry, I can't remember which, on the Joe Piscopo show. Joe Piscopo has a show? Yes, he does. <laughs> I didn't know you. But she said, I saw this production, I really liked the production, I thought it made a lot of good points, but I thought it went too far when it showed Donald Trump being assassinated and when it showed the President of the United States naked in the bathtub. That was her response, having seen the production. That got spun, and it didn't really take off till Fox and Friends on Sunday morning made it a subject of a 10 minute discussion. It then became regular Fox Fair, even after we closed, Sean Hannity gave one of the protesters 10 minutes on his show. It became Fox's cause, it was then picked up by a bunch of right-wing bloggers, particularly a guy named Marx, I forget his name, who offered a thousand dollar reward to anyone who would interrupt our show. He's a well-known right-wing blogger. So that, Fox and Friends on the one hand, and then this, I don't understand social media, but again, apparently there was a huge <laughs> amount of friends. Those were the two media forms I'm referring to. Neither of them talked about the show, and the image that all of them created was a completely false image which was of liberal New York elites cheering as President Trump is stabbed to death. That was not what happened in our production. Corey, when you, I mean, I read your piece in Vulture and you talked about you didn't see or know how specifically pointed it was in terms of depicting a Trump-esque figure. Well, you know, we're in the rehearsal room. I, I wasn't there for the uh, costume fitting that, uh, that, that the actor uh, playing Trump had, so I didn't know how, you know. And Just so, for, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're, we're going, we're conflating here, we're going back and forth, right? Is it Trump or is it Caesar? Julius Caesar. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, but it was, it was, it was, it was, you know, it was very deliberately very, evoking Donald yeah. Trump. Okay. Whereas in the rehearsal room, um, uh, the only way that you could really know that is that the, the actress playing Carl Kearney and his wife has a Slavic accent. Um, but there was nothing, he, he really wasn't doing uh, a, a Trump impression. There, there, were, there were echoes, um, but it wasn't really until we got into the space and I saw the costume that I, I, I knew how literal the Oscar's interpretation was. And so, again, I'm Kath, I want to go to you with, you know, the, again, I have not seen it, but the, but the script and the language is Julius Caesar, right? Yes. Okay. So people who are outraged that this is somehow Trump, maybe don't know Trump. Like he would never say any of those things. He can't string a complete no, sentence he, together. No, <laughs> he never would. Um, I think that uh, one thing, if they had sat through the play, or even if they had read the play, or read anything, <laughs> they would know that the assassination of Julius Caesar is is not a good thing. Okay. Sorry, is not a good thing in the play. It, it leads to uh, civil war. It leads to you know just a grand. It leads to the end of the republic. Um, and so the way that it, they just have no interest in or ability to uh, analyze a work of art as a whole thing, like the beginning, the middle, the end. No, it's just this one, as you said, it's just this one thing that they get from 
from TV or from Twitter. And I think it really points to um, the sort of the asymmetricality of the fight between a long form ancient art form like theater where it the to experience the to experience it you you have to you have a cost you have to sit there for however many hours ours was two hours we didn't have an intermission so people couldn't leave um and uh, uh whereas a, a tweet is takes no time to to, to really compose and and uh, it's instantly distributed and takes no time to, to really absorb. And so in a fight like that, there's, there's, no, there's no way you can, um, you, you can win on that, on that plane. Do you see it specifically though as, as a fight between the sort of immediacy of, of social media and this kind of historic art form? I mean, in terms of the way that people responded to the protest. I think, I think theater does have incredible power to, to stir people uh, emotionally and even even politically. But uh, as a, but politically, there's no way it, 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 it can compete because for one thing, good theater is not uh, attempting to uh, to move people. Uh, in, in one direction, a good play is complex. A, a great play like Julius Caesar can be performed an infinite amount of times in an infinite amount of ways, and everybody in the audience will have their own interpretation. I'm so interested in this parallel, though, of social media and and this ancient art form. And so, when Oscar, when you were casting and, and the production was coming together, who who were you envisioning was the audience? Well, I knew who the audience would be because I've been doing Shakespeare in the Park for a number of years, and the audience is New Yorkers, and for the most part, they are um, they're more diverse than most theater audiences, uh, ethnically and racially, but not as diverse as the city is. They're quite a bit younger than theater audiences because younger people are a lot willing to wait in line for a long time in the park. <laughs> uh, but they are New Yorkers. They are, by and large, people who uh, think the way that the New York cultural elite thinks. They are definitely progressive folks for the most part. So I knew I wasn't performing this piece for an audience in rural Minnesota, where I'm from. And I think that was a big part for me of what the, what the actual impact of the piece and what a lot of people knew the impact of the piece was before the whole conversation got hijacked by this social media thing, was it was actually doing what Aristotle says about pity and terror. It was taking many of our fantasies about what would happen if we just killed the guy. We're scared about our democracy. We're scared about what if we just struck out? And it played it through, and by the end of it, through pity and terror, purged those emotions. I can't tell you how many people, including me, watch that thing and go, you know what? We gotta do this through democratic means. This is- We gotta do what? We've, we've gotta resist President Trump and that agenda through democratic means because to try and do it otherwise has led to disaster. So you still hold out hope for democratic means? You bet. Because what's the alternative? I come from a tradition well, that does, didn't hold out hope for democratic means. Well, I think we have to think about really what the alternative is, Corey. I, I really do. I mean, one of the things that struck me also about your piece um, and what you're saying, Oscar, about, you know, um, there's a, a paragraph where you say, you know, suddenly I was aware that we were under attack. Um, and, and it's so interesting to me that it took this moment of theater, of art, for you as a white male actor, you as a white male director, to sort of think, okay, we are under attack. At any moment, we could be, uh, violence could be set upon us when for, uh, centuries, literally, people of color, black people in particular, um, who have contributed so much to art, have, feel that all the time. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the uh, it was like the day after the election, or the week after the election, uh, Dave Chappelle was hosting at uh, Saturday Night Live, and they had this great skit about this group of, uh, of uh, privileged white people watching the election, and they go, oh my god, the country's racist. 
and she put the back on me. And, right. No, I mean, there was that. There was that. Yes, yeah, there was that. I, I, mean, I mean, personally, I felt a similar thing on November 9th that I felt on, on, on September 11th, which was there's been a war going on. Um, and I'm on one side of it, and I didn't even realize it. What side are you on? <laughs> um, I'm on the side of of tolerance and and liberal democracy uh, and and facts. And um, I didn't realize that was a side. <laughs> you know, I didn't realize that, right. that, that, that that being on the side of facts was a choice. Um, well, that's the other thing, right? That, that this has really demonstrated for us is that we've come to a place where we're actually arguing or contemplating. The, like what we had all established already was like cool, uh, and and now some, somehow it's not. I mean, it's a real deconstruction. I mean, there and, uh, and dismantling, you know, of all of the progress um, that that we have tried to make. And I think that for me, it certainly as a black woman, I feel like the outrage, you know, the white outrage now is like okay, y'all. We, it would be great if you had sort of focused that a little bit more, maybe 200 years ago here in Jim Crow or, 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 or whatever, it's like to dismantle um, the evolution of slavery. But I, what, I, what I am interested, Oscar, in how this production and the response to it has changed your artistic vision. Well, uh, in one way, it hasn't changed it one bit, and that actually is the point of resistance, which is that the real... Uh, uh, desire of, for those who care about what the culture is actually doing is the desire is to just make us back down, just create a chilling effect, just you know, and it's a real deal. We 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 got death threats at home. My wife got death threats. My daughter got death threats. We got letters. We got phone calls on their cell phone. That is cause for pausing. You have to think. Wow really do that again next month? But you have to, because if you don't, you're exactly falling into, um, you know, you're doing what you shouldn't do. So would you say that this was the first time that you, that that, that kind of shook you in that way? I mean, again, this kind of death threats or this kind of trolling or this kind of, you know, I mean, I've had people call my home, you know, for years because I've been an opinion or critical uh, columnist or cultural critic about various things, but I'm, I'm curious if this was for you the first time that was sort of like, wow. I, I, would, yeah, I come from a family of three generations of people who spent time in prison or 16 years in exile for their political beliefs, so no, it's not the first time it's occurred to me. It's the first time I've gotten a series of death threats. It's the first time since I've had a family that there have been death threats in my family, yes. I think, though, the, the, the connection I want to make with the show is that what Mark Antony does in the show, uh, in Friends Around the Country, is in a way, you could say, it's a form of democracy. He appeals directly to the people who rise up and overthrow Brutus and Cassius and the attempted uh, saviors of the Republic. But of course, it isn't democracy at all. It's exactly what Fox and Friends and what the Reverend Bloggers were doing by Pimpy. It is overriding any institution that is a democratic institution that's designed to bring together people's voices and give it power and representation. And by appealing directly to the people, that is precisely the formulation of fascism. Institutions of great corporate power appealing directly to the masses to support their agenda. And that's what happens in the play, and that was in a very mild form what happened in the response to our production. So it's fine. The public theater is going to be fine. I'm not worried about the public theater. But I am worried about the dozens of other theaters across the country who got death threats because people thought they were the theater doing Julius Caesar. I'm worried about the Dallas Shakespeare Festival who've gotten death threats. And what is the worry? The worry is that it creates a climate where everybody just steps back, where everybody just doesn't want to take it on because you know what, the cost is too great. And so do you feel that, th that the response is more likely to be stepping back than rising forward? You bet. I think the response for the little Shakespeare festivals that don't have the huge donor base that we have, for the smaller theaters who've got, in, in red states who have board members who are Republicans and Trump voters, 
Absolutely. For monetary reasons? Absolutely. That money's at the root of everything. You know, and certainly in the arts, we're all struggling for money. The public is an incredibly privileged position. We have a huge loyal base. We have enough sources of income so that we can afford to be brave. But it also means we have an obligation to be brave. Because if we're not, who, who the hell is supposed to be? And you know, that's, so the one way, I, I wanna answer the, the, the other part of your question, how has the artistic practice changed? The thing that I'm sure of is, as my friend Jason Dushin, who runs Dream Era in the Bronx says, we need to lean into the red. If we looked at an electoral map in the United States and the red and the blue, and you told me, oh, the blue is where all the nonprofit theaters are, I would believe you that that was the map. Look at it in that way, it's not the red states that turned their back on us, it's we've turned our back on them. What, you know, when, when, when we did the Hamilton deal and, you know, to the vice president, and there was, you know, the outrage of the president, suddenly there's a petition to boycott Hamilton. 20,000 people sign a petition to boycott the other side. <laughs> well, it's funny that you start thinking about it because those 200,000 people who boycott Hamilton, none of them were ever going to see Hamilton. <laughs> Hamilton was too expensive for them, is too expensive for them. It was never going to come to a town where they were, and if it did, they wouldn't have the connections to get a ticket. So they weren't boycotting Hamilton. Hamilton had already boycotted them. We have not taken seriously that if we want to actually make this country work, we have to show that, and now when I say we, I'm talking about the cultural industry, those of us who work in that, we have to actually make sure that what we're doing is being offered to everybody. And we've done a piece poor job of that. Agreed. Chanda, what was wrong with the play? The production. Well, I'm trying to reconstruct my, my thought. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I felt that, okay, <laughs> I felt that um, the play, after the um, assassination of Caesar, we are meant to see uh, the conspirators as representing some kind of idea of democracy, um, but they, or for the people, the, the peop at one point the people are sort of switching sides and all like this, but actually, I didn't see them that way. I didn't think they were at all about democracy. They were about uh, the power of the aristocratic elite against a popular dictator. Um, so I would have liked that point, which maybe I was being too historical there, um, but I would have liked that. I became a little confused about like, oh, okay, so who are, what are the people doing now? And they're, they're being shot by who? Um, so that was a little confusing for me, but it was all receded in my mind, and I can hardly remember it. All I remember is how wonderful it was. That's, that's <laughs> a, I mean, I will say, Kathy is historically absolutely right, as Michael Parenti's book teaches us, as any number of progressive historians read. In actual historic Rome, Caesar was a very progressive figure who was attempting to expand the enfranchisement of people against an aristocratic elite. That wasn't a story that I thought the play had to tell, and it wasn't a story that I thought resonated particularly with me right now. The danger of our populist leader is not that he's taking power away from an aristocratic elite. Our populist leader is giving power to our aristocratic elite. So I was interested in a Brutus and a Cassius and a set of conspirators who looked like the Obama coalition who actually were the folks who were trying to fight for an expanded enfranchisement. And I don't think the text contradicted me that much. No, you can just... I want to disagree. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what was, what, was the, what was the tenor like uh, among the cast pre and post uh, protest? Um, I mean, it was, it was a great experience, um, you know, certainly through the, you know, from the, from the first read through, um, it was very clear that, that, that Oscar had assembled a really strong um, and, and, and dynamic and diverse cast. Um, and so that was really exciting. It was a, it was a, it was a really kind, um, uh, courageous uh, re rehearsal room. Um, and, and then, you know, once we started performing, the, the audiences seemed to really be uh, um, uh, having a great reaction to it. 
I think the one thing I talked about this in my piece a little bit, uh, we had to fight hard because there was, um, there are oddly, Shakespeare writes a number of sort of laugh lines after the assassination. So there's this moment where we assassinate uh, uh, Caesar and the Senate, in the, in the Senate, and, the, and everybody leaves and it's just the conspirators and, and Caesar's corpse. And we sort of make some jokes and they were getting the laughs that, that, I, that maybe Shakespeare intended, um, which was really not what we, we didn't want to be that image of a bunch of elites, uh, you know, uh, having this uh, effigy of, 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 of Trump, you know, covered in blood. Um, uh, the idea was to confront the mostly liberal audience with the reality of, of whatever sort of violent fantasies they may have had. And so it took a few performances, maybe a week or so, to really kill those laughs. And once we did, um, I thought we really uh, got to a great place. And then, of course, once um, there was a political reaction outside, which surprised us, almost all of us. There was there a couple people who were expecting it, but um, it, I think our, our instincts as craftspeople kicked in. And I don't think we admitted to ourselves or to each other how scared we were, because there was a threat of violence, even though uh, the, the interruptions were, were all uh, uh, benign. Um, you know, getting up there and having the focus <coughs> that you need to, to, to speak blank verse and to be engaged with the story you're telling, um, you don't have enough uh, mind space to also watch your back. Uh, and so we had to, I, I had to constantly remind myself, there are security guards. That's their job to watch your back. My job is to embody this text. And um, that was that was exhausting. Um, but, uh, but you know, thank God we had that. I mean, right. I, mean, I mean, did it change the way that you think about current resistance, uh, what's going on in um, reaction Black Lives Matter or, or any of the uh, indigenous rise-ups? Or did it change the way that you think about that kind you know, of well, I think, activism? You know, as, you know, as a, a privileged, uh, cisgendered white man, uh, this was one of the first times where there was a real cost to um, to my my public identity, or to my public to my being in public, um, and that was that was that was profound. And it has changed you how? It has. It's definitely made me. Uh, uh, it's it's made me think about the projects that I choose. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I see myself as an interpretive artist and not a creative artist, so... I don't know what that means. Well, um, I didn't write the play, and I don't, I don't write as of now. Uh, my job is to take the, the, the words that are given me uh, by an author and through the filter of the vision of the director, try to bring that to life. So, it's an odd place for an actor. You're often the, the, the most visible part of any production or a TV show or movie. Uh, and yet you often are pretty low down the totem pole in terms of control of what that message is. Um, and so it's, that's going to be, that's a lifelong case by case basis struggle. Because I, you know, I very well could have been completely at odds with Oscar's vision of, of, of the play. Um, but it would have been my job still to embody Brutus in, in, in this production. Um, so, yeah, I, again, it's, it's a case-by-case -case basis, and it's, you know, art is a very tricky thing because, you know, as I said before, I, I didn't get the whole idea that we were going to confront a liberal audience with their, their violent uh, fantasies. Um, I didn't really get that until the audience saw it. And I could have been very resistant and said, oh, I don't want to be a part of this. And I would have missed out on being a part of something that I really do believe in. So uh, th that's all to say, uh, it, it's made me more aware, but I don't know exactly what the outcome is going to be of that awareness. Kevin, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, I'm curious about 
probably you're sitting with a with a friend or a colleague or a peer, and they say this play just it perpetuates this, this violence. It's a, it's you know Trump is terrible, but we need to give him an opportunity. You know this, I don't have any friends like that. <laughs> I, I, said, I said colleague or peer as well. I work at the <laughs> but I'm asking you to challenge yourself and yes, think about yes, that response, yes. right? You know, because yes. they're out there, clearly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 um, I would want to tell that person he had a chance. It's been six months. Come on. Um, <laughs> I want I to just follow up on something that Oscar said, which was, was so interesting, which is the way that the kind of culture that we all love and appreciate is really a we stay mostly urban kind of thing. And I think that that is so unfortunate and that's part of this story is that, that we all have a great deal of experience in uh, seeing things from multiple points of view, um, in the theater, in going to the theater, in, uh, in being able to do a certain kind of abstraction where things you don't take things so literally. Um, so that uh, I understand that in, um, at the, um, the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis in 2012, there was a, 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 a Caesar who was played as, a, as Obama. But nobody cared because we're the kind of people who think, okay, all right, have your fun. You know, I wait, was, wait, 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 wait. What? That's why you think uh, nobody said anything? Why do you think that? Because he's black. Yeah, well, okay. All right, well, maybe that too. But, but what I'm saying is, I think that we, I, at least I have a feeling that if I don't like something, if I'm offended by something, and I am offended by art sometimes, well, okay, because the next time it's going to be something I really like. Um, but if you're not part of that world, then you don't ever have that feeling that comes around to you. And I think that a lot of those Trumpy people out there just really feel they have no way of relating to the kinds of things that interest us. They don't read the same kind of books, they don't read the same kind of newspapers, they don't even watch the same things on TV. I mean, you might have seen that map, and it was fascinating, this map in the New York Times of like what were the most popular shows where around the country. Um, and there were, you know, they don't watch Game of Thrones in many red states. My favorite. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's interesting just that Shakespeare, we, we've all sort of agreed that Shakespeare's a great writer. It's my firm belief that the reason that Shakespeare's the greatest writer in the history of the English language is that when Elizabeth took the throne, it wasn't just that she didn't require people to hew to the religious line of the state. She actually forbade it. The Tudor Compromise was the first time that nobody was allowed to tell religious stories in the theater because they were so concerned about damping down the Protestant Catholic um, uh, uh, tensions. So Shakespeare was the first generation of Western storytellers in 2,000 years since the Greeks whose job was to tell secular stories, whose job was to tell stories in which everybody could see themselves. And, and as a result, in this really beautiful poet, because he was a beautiful poet from birth, had to turn himself into the greatest player because he had to find a way to speak to everybody. And you know, it's it's just and, and so there's something about the demand on an art form to try to speak to everybody that I think can bring out the greatness in the art form. And I think that's something we need to start doing. When you say he had to learn how to speak to everybody, like who is everybody? What we know of about the Elizabethan audience is completely illiterate groundlings were in the pit at the same time as aristocrats, as the you know the, the court performance, the King Queen would see the same shows, or Queen, um, Oxford and Cambridge graduates. He had to figure out ways to write plays that not only would everybody could enjoy, but because it's the theater, and you guys all know this feeling, for a piece of theater to work, everybody has to enjoy it at the same time in somewhat the same way. They have to have group reactions together. So that means basically he's got to write plays that not only appeal to all these people, but reveal to them what they have in common with each other. Reveal to them what is, sh you know, the, those groundlings and that Cambridge graduate had to see those plays and see themselves in it. And it's why 200 years later, 
there's this huge movement to deny that Shakespeare wrote his plays because it is impossible that the greatest writer in the history of the English language didn't go to Oxford. It's impossible that he wasn't an aristocrat. He must have been an aristocrat. Now, the whole authorship controversy is class-based. It's all about trying to say, it's to deny the great achievement of Shakespeare, which was to be not class-based, but actually, so, I'm sorry. This is no, that's <laughs> very passionate. Yes, so that far for that. Thank you. But how does Shakespeare translate today for a modern American multicultural, multiracial, multi gender identifying audience? Depends on how you're doing. What what I what we we do, you know, we all year long we're touring Shakespeare to prisons and homeless shelters around New York City. You watch those audiences respond and it's astonishing. Now those are productions that are made knowing that's where we're going, but they're not dumbed down. They're just actually made sure that they are I know. I, I, no, and I certainly would not suggest that they be dumbed down, but I'm right. thinking of something that Kappa said, which is that the Trumpy folks don't respond to the books or the art or the theater or the whatever that we like, we being culturally, intellectually, whatever we are, but I do think that really good writing, really good theater, really good whatever has this this appeal. We're, we're taking... Um, Lynn Nottage's play Swift, which won the Pulitzer this year. And we, we are taking that on a mobile tour to the rural counties of Wisconsin, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. And, exactly, and we're not doing it to teach anybody anything. We're doing it to go there and say, you know, the thing that we make, we think it's of interest to you. And then we're going to figure out how we can listen to those audiences and how we, because I, I, we, we just haven't tried to do it. We've spent an enormous amount of energy, and now when I say we, I'm just a public theater, spent an enormous amount of energy trying to reach audiences throughout New York City who don't get access to the We've tried, and we've done pretty well as a million. We haven't done anything, and the entire American theater hasn't done anything about reaching those huge rafts of the, of the of the red states who gave us our president who may destroy the republic. We have <laughs> tried to reach these people. And we need to, again, not to not to educate them, but to connect with them, which is what the theater is supposed to do. Agreed. Corey, that, that moment when you felt afraid, uh, have you felt that since in your everyday life? Uh, well, there was a there was some time where uh, I I posted what I had written on Facebook and I made it public, um, and uh, you know that it, it was very quickly got inundated by 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 very hateful um, messages, and so I sort of shut that off. Uh, but no, I mean, uh, at least aside from that. No. We, I think, uh, we all have index cards. If you have questions, um, we're going to open it up to questions from you all. Or at least I think it's going to be the same. There's, a, uh, there's one image that I want to say when you're talking about how the actors responded. The first Friday, you were there, the first time that somebody rushed the stage. And it was right after Trump had been executed. And we hadn't really understood. Because in some way it feels, Oscar, like, you know, I mean, it's your fantasy a little bit. Sure. Yeah. You bet. Okay. You bet. That's what you're supposed Just to do. Just to clarify. <laughs> but, but we haven't really talked about the detail of what to do because we hadn't known what would happen. We hadn't realized. So we hadn't talked to the actors about what to do. And so uh, uh, my delightful friend, Issa Davis, who played Misha's Brutus, I adore Issa. And she's Angela's niece, she's a very political person. But her instinct, of course, was to walk right up to the person who shouldn't say and try to reason with her. <laughs> Not realizing, I think, that she was still holding the knife. Covered with she, and so that image of he's a walking towards her in that, but you know, this is not the way we should approach this tomorrow. <laughs> Wow.
kind of Shakespeare style here. Would a Trumpian Titus Andronicus be going too far? <laughs> <laughs> We've actually joked about this a fair amount for those of you who aren't Shakespeare Greeks. The essential um, action in Titus is where Titus actually feeds the children of his greatest enemy to him in pies. Um, yeah. And the reason that I, I, I so I've actually thought about it. Uh, the reason I wouldn't do that is actually, I don't think Titus is very interesting as a political commentary. I think Julius Caesar is a political play. Titus is, Titus is something much darker and more primeval than that. I wouldn't try to make political analogies with it. I don't think it would work. Corey, you got anything? No. Okay. <laughs> Does using Trump as Caesar ruin the focus of the play? This is a uh, answer that can only be given by those of you who see it. Um, it sure didn't for me. And by the way, I kept watching, you know, we didn't decide to know what that costume was until we decided. I kept watching, and, and all you can do is sort of judge your own response. Do you, I still like this? I did. To me, the thing that worked about it was that by making that analogy, it made me viscerally understood both the appeal and the terror of populist politicians. And for me, that didn't ruin the play at all. I would like to know what the appeal is. The sense of somebody who will just speak his mind, who is not afraid to say whatever he thinks, who, f who feet. I mean, I hear that. I do. I hear that all the time. And I think when he speaks his mind, he's not even speaking. <laughs> yeah, but, but, I mean, I actually think it's a, a theatrical thing. What Trump plays is the role of the aggrieved victim. And I think there are millions of people who identify with him because they feel like a great victim. But the other thing he has is he has a superpower, which is he's a billionaire. So it's actually a comic book fantasy that if I wanted, if I were me, but I had a billion dollars, I could stick it to them. And that is an emotional connection. It's not rational at all. It doesn't even really have to do with politics. It has to do with that feeling of a great victimhood, which. I'm sure you could talk about more eloquently than me. How but this is not about me. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no offense to Corey, who was great, <laughs> but did you ever consider casting a woman as Brutus? Um, what I will honestly say is I cast everybody in the show who I wanted to cast, and I wanted to cast Beth Marvel, and I didn't actually want to cast a woman. I wanted to cast Beth Marvel as Mark Antony. Corey is who I wanted to cast as Brutus because I think Corey is a great actor and because the qualities that he has as an actor are qualities that for me were explosively correct for Brutus, and I thought that was right. But there's sort of no reason not to think of casting a woman as Brutus. Explosively correct. <laughs> <laughs> The hot button issue is Bruce's conflict between loyalty and citizenship. Will the chilling effect of sponsors mean that all theaters are doomed to produce the Fantastics? <laughs> <laughs> you mean that musical glorification of right? Um, <laughs> no. And it certainly, I mean, listen, I, I should be quite clear. The public theater received three times as much in increased donations as we lost from corporate sponsors. I mean, you guys, you aren't just overcoming the public. So we made money off it. Now, again, let's see if we can reproduce that every year the way we used to do Delta Airlines donation. But anyway, we'll figure out that. And, hey, shout out. The day after Delta announced this, we got a phone call from JetBlue saying, can we be your official airline? <laughs> <laughs> Again, my worry is not for the public. We are in a privileged position. My worry is for all of those other institutions that are much more economically vulnerable, are much more politically vulnerable than the theater. And I, you know, honestly, the, the biggest criticism I have of us is I don't think we've figured out yet how to advocate enough successfully for people other than ourselves, other than the public. And that's, we're wrestling with it. We take that really seriously. Um, 
And I don't, I, I don't think we've got the right answer. Corey, mm -hmm. what do you do to psychologically prepare for going on stage knowing you could be attacked by protesters? You know, I was really fortunate to have a really big role. You know, I, was, I had a lot of lines to say. I was, you know, either on stage or changing uh, you know, to, to get back onto stage. Um, so I really, I didn't have the, the headspace to really think about that. Um, I know there were, there were several other people, there were a lot of people in the play who had, you know, fewer or, or no lines, and I think that gave them the, the time to, uh, to let their, their imaginations run wild. Um, and, 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 and I remember my father is a or high school principal, and I remember during 9-11, during I was, I, for the weeks after, I was really out of sorts, and I remember talking to him, and he was incredibly calm and put together because he had this group of, of children and staff to, to take care of. So I think, you know, uh, busyness um, can, can distract you from, from, from danger. I'm going to direct this at you, Kathy. Would you like to see Trump impeached? You know, this is such a fascinating question. Trump did such a wise thing when he made Mike Pence <laughs> his vice president. Because it was like an insurance policy because, oh, if you don't like me, you'll get him. Uh, so I go back and forth because uh, I don't think he will be impeached. I think the Republicans are getting everything they want out of him. They don't like him. He, you know, he's horrible. They hate him. But still, um, he's working for them. Um, so, but if, if it were to happen, the good side of it would be it would only happen in a context in which people were really, really fed up and angry and that whole uh, thing we've been discussing here had fallen apart, that whole sense of this is our politics of grievance and all like that. Um, but the bad side of this is we would get Pence, who is a much better, smoother politician, who has the same horrible politics, who is a, virtually a theocrat, who won't even have dinner with the woman who isn't his wife. Uh, <laughs> I mean, really. Um, and he would be, and, and then, then the media would all say, oh, okay, now we've got a normal Republican. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. The thing that's sort of interesting about Trump is he's really a kind of an abnormal human being. Um, and, and, and the media hates him because of, you know, he's so outrageous um, and rude. And, I mean, what he did at the Boy Scout Jamboree, I mean, really. Um, but there's so many things. Yes, there's so many things. How can you choose this one? But, but I think that Pence would be a much more successful version of those politics. So that would be bad. So I don't know. <laughs> What should happen? You know, I mean, on that line of thinking of, you know, Pence being sort of worse and that that was such uh -huh. a wise business move, really, on yeah. Trump's part. Um, you know, some of us here are parents. I'm raising a black boy uh, in, in this country right now, and it, which is hard enough already. But with the, with the president uh, being who he is, um, how, how do you feel like your conversations with young people, Oscar, I, I don't know if, if the public engages a lot with young people, I imagine you all do, you're a parent of young person. Like how how do we integrate the abnormal, normal, or normal abnormally, you know, of normalness of, of what's happening right now in our government and in in, a, in the position, the, the a highest position in, in, in the country. Well, my son is two, so he doesn't. <laughs> but he's gonna be mad. He's gonna be mad. Uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully by the time he's cognizant. What's going on? He won't be president anymore. Um, yeah, I, I think part of art is to not allow ourselves to uh, to just take this in as 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 normal or acceptable. I think part of art is to uh, to reignite our um, our outrage um, at, at, at injustices in the world. Yeah, and I think, again, I don't, I think, you know, the, the staff of the public is so fantastic and did such an amazing job of handling this. And I think, again, we did a great job of defending ourselves to our community. 
I don't think we've figured out yet how to amplify that. That's exactly right. So that we're telling yeah. our story beyond the... But you think about that. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, in it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new thought because, you know, I, boy, I thought, you know, with the help of the Tom McCann and Candy and the, the, my whole press and marketing team, you know, we devised thoughtful, calm, classy, dignified. Mm -hmm. I, we just, we looked so good, right? We all, all were so proud of us. It made no impression outside of our little circle. Right. In our little circle, we thought, oh, they're so classic. But I've never had to think that way before. I've never had to think, oh, shoot. We have to think about how we're gonna pierce that and be defending the values of free speech, the values of provocative art, the necessity of provocative art to people who don't at all understand why we do that. I had a couple of, I mean, I, this I really won't name names, but I had a couple of conversations with very prominent politicians, who progressive politicians, who did not understand why we should be doing what we were doing. It's not, you know, they like the public, they like I mean, but why do you have to do this? Can't you? And to really have that conversation about, no, 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 the role of art. This is what, and again, people will listen to it, but there's a big lacuna, there's a big absence of understanding the uh, importance of a vigorous and aggressive free speech, not just a toleration of free speech. And I think, too, that the role of art is really very many things. And that ultimately, you know, what you're saying of, of kind of succeeding at looking good in your posse or squad of folks <laughs> is fine, but that's not art. Art goes beyond. Art is in our bones. Art is how we talk and reach one another and change things and create revolutions. So that... Yeah. Well, I also think it's, it's more than just about appearing good to our folks, though. I think, they're, they're, I think you know, even though you sort of uh, uh, thought that that wasn't enough, it was, it, it's an essential act, though, to give comfort to those people in our community in our artistic community who are, whose, whose, whose instincts are to become afraid and to step back. And so I, I, even though that's not enough, it's, a, it's, it's essential to, as, as an artistic community, to, to, to not apologize when an apology isn't warranted. And I do think, and perhaps I'm giving too much credit, but I've, I've known uh, people who work in art from very, very small theaters to huge, multi-billion dollar movies that that aren't necessarily art, but but people who are truly invested in using art to uh, to push the needle, to champion discourse, to have people see themselves, are gonna put that play on. They're gonna put that play on. Well we gotta make sure that um, we are as supportive as possible of those people. We don't leave people alone to figure it out themselves. That's the I would like to thank my panelists. Oscar, who says hi. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. conversation and a larger conversation. We do this year round and I invite you to follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, become a member. We've heard about how important it is to support the work of those people who are, you know, defending uh, free expression, free speech, and uh, we just uh, count on your support and join us for many more events. You have a list of upcoming events on the back of your program tonight. Thank you again. The bar is open for a few, uh, um, for half an hour, I think. So that's minimal. And you can meet our panel as well. Thank you. Thank you.